Uh, just in case you need a reminder, I'm Dr. Pasco, and you probably won't see me in the classroom very much, unfortunately, since you have your own anatomy, gross anatomy course, but you'll see me in a lot of other places. You'll see me if I'm your advisor. And I am chair of the mentoring committee, so that's why I'm here today to give you an overview of the capstone project. We really handled a lot of the overview of academic advising during orientation. You've all met with your academic advisors, and so that is off and, and sailing. And now it's time to get you thinking about your capstone, which sounds crazy to think about it now, but we need you to get cracking on that early because two years is going to go by very fast, and it will only serve you to start thinking about your area of interest and things like that. So before we get started, I wanted to point out that the slides are available at this short URL. And I am going to be moving on in a, in a minute or two here. So I've got the short URL on the board. And this is case sensitive. So make sure you get MHA in caps. And I find myself putting a lot of my presentations together on Google Drive now. So hopefully the internet is stable and that all works well. And you can view these slides. And they're going to be on the web, of course. But you can export them as a PDF if that's more your style, OK? So the slides are text heavy because we just have a lot of policy to get through, a lot of tips, a lot of best practices, a lot of timelines. So that's going to be the nature of the talk. And it's going to be a really good thing for you to review this as you're going through semester to semester because it's going to have a lot of details that are nowhere near your radar. Year two, what does that look like in the fall? That's not really here and now. So I did set up a Panopto recording. Hi, everyone at home. And so this is being recorded <laughs> with the idea that as you get to maybe the relevant point in your timeline, you can pull the video up. And uh, we'll, we'll make that happen logistically. We'll get the video to you. And maybe you have a hard time getting to sleep at night. So you can just put this on. <laughs> and I'm sure my voice will do the trick. So let's get started with our capstone overview. And this is going to be that second component that is under the direction of the mentoring committee, one of several committees in the program. So we already tackled the academic advising stuff. Now let's get on to capstone. So let's start with the purpose. Why even bother? So we want to have you guys presented with an opportunity to contribute to the anatomical sciences. OK, make your mark, contribute something to the field of anatomy. And that actually doesn't look the same for every capstone project, right? There's a lot of different ways this could look. So this could look like a novel discovery. Maybe you find something that has never been described before. OK, that's kind of a very lofty expectation, but it could happen. We're not going to rule it out. You can definitely construct what we would consider a deliverable. So here are some examples of deliverables, educational resources, models, or even a database. So maybe you want to measure some anthropometric variable of the skeletal system. OK, maybe we have a lot of bones in the bone room that you could measure that create a database, and then make that available for other research, OK? And another popular deliverable is a module where you have a narrated set of slides that's made available on the web. Maybe there's a quiz associated with it. So that's an example of a capstone project deliverable. And we can have something like a validation study. So maybe there is some method that is described in the clinical world, but we're not really sure of the underlying anatomy behind it, or we want to slightly tweak the way something's done in the clinic. So the anatomical scientists that you all are could help you know, figure that out. Okay? Can you really put the needle where you're claiming you can put the needle? Okay? So that would be a validation type study. And we even have the classic hypothesis-driven scientific work or research. Okay, you'll work with your capstone mentor. We have this idea. We think something will happen if we manipulate this variable and see what happens. Okay, so that is definitely an acceptable capstone project. So that's the purpose and that's what it can look like. And now let's just talk about some of the guidelines for selecting a project. So I do have at the bottom here, please note that all of these deliverables and uh, modules and databases, all these data and, and project information, this is going to become property of the University of Colorado, and this is the nature of research at this institution, okay? So it's not a bad thing, it's just the way things are. 
and it's also going to allow you to use the University of Colorado name to add some support behind your work and when you further disseminate it as well, right? So some of our guidelines, we definitely want you and we encourage you to use technology and imaging in your project, but this is not required, okay? So there's a lot of flexibility in what you can incorporate into your capstone project. We're a modern human anatomy program. Your curriculum in the first year has imaging and modeling in it. So as you think about what I might want to do for my capstone project, you may incorporate um, technology or some type of imaging focus in it. Because you're going to have those skills. And the capstone project is taking those skills and building upon them for a deliverable, for example. Okay. And of course, it should incorporate anatomy. But does it have to incorporate human anatomy? And the answer is no. You could maybe do some kind of equine, bovine model, mouse model. Uh, some projects have included you know, mice models, OK? And that's definitely OK. You don't have to stick to the human. The scope of the project should fit within the program timeline. So you are going to be hitting your didactic coursework the first 12 months and then getting into your capstone the second 12 months. So you definitely can't bite off a very big project that is not possible to finish in 12 months, OK? So that's what the capstone mentor can help you with. They'll be able to kind of help scale your project. I don't think you're going to be able to sequence the mouse genome. Let's scale it back to something smaller. And it's a really good opportunity to meet your interests and your goals. You're going to be working on this a lot. Don't pick something that's boring to you. Pick something that really inspires you and motivates you. And also your career goals. We're all at different phases. And I remember what it was like to be in grad school. And it's intimidating to know what you're going to do for the next 10 years. But if you're already thinking a little bit ahead of what your next step after the program will be, try to think of an area that your project would fit into that would serve you in your next step. Maybe you're interested in physical therapy school. So maybe it would be really impressive to do a project that focuses on the musculoskeletal system, which is at the foundation of physical therapy. You're doing your interview for PT school. By the way, in my master's program, I did a project on the in distal insertion of the tibialis anterior or something like that. And then that might you know, really help you in gaining a spot in a PT program. So that's what we mean by meeting your career goals. You can really build a nice bridge. Team-based projects are possible. So maybe there's a really nice set of data that multiple students can tackle, but at different angles. So you can do the group project, but each student must work on an individual piece that meets all the capstone requirements. It's not like one person can pull the weight of the other two or three, for example. So that, that's an option, and keep that in mind. Some of the capstone mentors that you would be um, exposed to and interacting with some of the MHA faculty, they may have group projects in mind. Okay, so that would be an option as well. So here are some examples of capstone projects, and I took a screenshot of the website, so I hope you guys are utilizing the MSMHA website for a lot of this stuff, and I already um, put a slide in that reviews what these uh, example projects are from our first graduating class, of which there were four students. So these are the um, titles of the projects. And then this is a little bit more of a description of what they did in that project. So one project was developing a novel interactive virtual histology laboratory with none other than Dr. Lee. Hello. So that was uh, a really nice project that really turned out a really nice deliverable uh, that you all might be using in histology right now. So very good. That was an MHA project. Segmentation of atypical mitochondria and mice taste cells. Uh, data were made available uh, of a mouse taste bud. And so this needed to be described in three dimensions. And so that's what segmentation does. You take these sections of this certain structure within a taste cell and then build a 3D model, measure, do these different things. That's an example of a project. This was that, an example of a validation study that I mentioned. A clinician on campus was trying to describe a slightly different way of blocking the maxillary nerve, one of the branches of your trigeminal nerve. And so the student went into several cadavers with varying approaches to find out which approach resulted in the dye hitting the nerve the most. Okay, So validating what is done in the clinic um, in the cadaver. 
And then the 3D modeling of the taste bud cells, this was somewhat related. I think it was using the same data as the second project here. And um, yeah, so one of your more classic studies, we think that we're going to find these parameters of our cells, so hypothesis driven, and then looking at the data and finding the results. So yes, Dr. Lee. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, perfect. Good. So working with the same capstone mentor, for example, and the project had two different facets of it, and so each student worked on the different part on their own, but collectively they described, you know, some aspect of the taste cells of the mouse. Okay, so perfect example. Very good. What questions do you have up to this point as I hit you with bullets? Good. Good pace here. Very good. Okay. So this is where you are right now. How do I start? This might be where your brain is right now. So I already have a project idea. It's going to be this top row, and then maybe you have no idea or no project. So in the first year, these are the steps that we recommend that you take. So with the idea or project in mind, start to look for the mentor that can guide you in that area or with that project. And so you're going to seek assistance from folks like myself and Dr. Lee. We are academic advisors being part of the mentoring committee. So I would imagine you remember and you've already met with your academic advisor. Reach out to them and have them give you some assistance in identifying a capstone mentor. If you have that idea or project in mind, I've had advisees that come to me saying, I really want to do a project on uh, polycystic kidney disease. That is not anything I know anything about. I'm not a pathologist but I can help refer to the right person, okay? So that's what your academic advisor may do. They may know right away who's doing work in that field, or they might give you tools to search on campus for the right person. If you have no project or no idea, here are some possible ideas for identifying mentors. This seminar series right now, including the person talking at you right now, has ideas for projects that need students to help you know, move them through. And so you could use any one of these or approach any of these seminar presenters as possible capstone mentors, okay? Also the core faculty. Wow, that's me too, nice. So we can definitely help out. And we're looking for uh, students to work on projects. And then general networking. So this could be going to other grand rounds or other seminars on campus. Um, yeah, other lectures and things like that, maybe going to symposia on campus that are going on in the area of interest. So just that general networking. And I'll even throw out there, because I'm the nerd that I am, you might even be able to network with somebody through social media that has some research going on on campus, and you might be able to reach out and establish a connection that way. It could happen. It's 2014, okay? So now you've got your mentor identified. Then you're going to move into capstone completion. Uh, agreement form. So for you guys, uh, this may be a moving date, but definitely by around the middle of May, we want you to have identified a capstone mentor and signed this agreement form with them that lays out the responsibilities of everyone involved. The student, the capstone mentor, it's a form, which means Jennifer's done a great job of making it available on our website. Okay? I think I have a screenshot of that coming up. And then you're going to start work on the preliminary proposal. Okay, so now we're getting at the very end of your spring semester, and we're going to talk about the details of the preliminary proposal coming up here, but this flowchart is taking you from, I have an idea, I don't have an idea, to finding a capstone mentor, getting an agreement form signed, and then beginning work on a proposal. So what questions do you have on this flow? Yes. So with the person who chooses to do a capstone, do they have to be affiliated with CU? Ooh, do they have to be affiliated with CU as I'm Scanning, most are, but I don't think there's anything that prevents that. But Jennifer's hand shot up, so what can we say to that?
Garneau, Garneau, Nicole Garneau. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. yeah, that's right. So for those at home, the answer is no, they don't have to be affiliated with this campus, this university. Okay. Yep. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. So here is that database on the website that is listing MSMHA capstone project ideas, and they are either arranged by project or you can look at these projects arranged by capstone mentor because several MHA faculty might have different projects going on that you could be a part of. So this is just a way of kind of looking around, seeing if anything piques your interest, okay? So you are identifying this person, what or how are you gonna approach them? So we think that an email or phone request for an appointment is the best way to start, okay? That would be a good early step. You wanna then meet in person to discuss your desire, to work with the mentor, and when you do that, make sure you have details. Don't just kind of approach this busy clinician or faculty member and say, hey, you know, what, what are you doing in your lab? I, I read about this and I think I wanna do it. What do you think? Try to have some detailed um, information at hand as you're going in. I see you're working on the mouse taste bud and what kind of projects uh, would you need assistance with and things like that. Just, just go in there with a little bit of information instead of blind and expect them to drive the process. It's very much student-driven and student-motivated, okay? But I think that's self-evident. Yeah, so the background on the project of interest. Very good. You might get that background on that project because they talked about it in the seminar, okay? And then, uh, yep, you'll want to approach the seminar speaker after the seminar. You know, for example, I just mentioned this. Be mindful of the mentor's busy schedule. So start setting up your appointments ahead of time and don't blow them off. That is a big no-no. Yes. So this is really difficult to have last minute requests for paperwork. Oh man, uh, it's May 15th. I need to get my capstone mentor agreement signed. Oh, you're out of town. You're internationally known. You're in Costa Rica for a conference. That's gonna be a barrier, okay? So make sure you avoid the last minute stuff. And when you're unsure or you can't establish a contact on your own, who are you gonna find? You're gonna come to your academic advisor and we can help sometime facilitate connections, uh, introductions and things like that, okay? Very good. So in terms of the level of detail and the expectation for the capstone, like what are we really asking you to do? We do want you to come up with an independent contribution to your capstone. However, it may not be feasible for you to have the entire capstone project on your own. It may originate from the capstone mentor, okay? So we don't expect you to submit for an R01 research grant. That's a little bit laughable, right? Find the mentor that has the funding, that has the project idea, and then meet with them, and we encourage you to go beyond what the mentor is doing. So try to have an extension or an independent contribution to what the mentor is doing. This is encouraged but not required. So maybe we, we want you to not just do exactly what the capstone mentor is telling you to do. There's no real independent thought there that is acceptable as a capstone project, but we really encourage you to meet with the mentor and kind of have a two-way discussion. Okay, so what are you doing? What's the project? Actually, I have experience in this. Maybe this technique would work a little bit better if we do it this way, or why do you do that method? Have you thought about using another method? So try to come up with your own extension or novel contribution to the project that the men capstone mentor is proposing with you, okay? And I can't say this enough. I'm gonna say it now, I've said it before. Get started on thinking about your topic, your area, a potential mentor right now, even though you're in the midst of histology, a lot of other things are going on, find an hour every week to start poking around the web, start searching, um, and then as we go through the seminar series, just be thinking about these presenters, these capstone mentors. Maybe you came in with an area of interest already. And the fall seminar series. So just uh, also consider reaching out to faculty to help brainstorm, 
storm potential mentors. It's now getting into November, middle of November. I still haven't thought of anything. There's no problem emailing your academic advisor, setting up a meeting. We'll just sit at a whiteboard and start throwing things out. Just what could be a good capstone idea, okay? We really need you to help drive that process and look at your own interests, okay? But don't rule out the faculty. And let's say you have an idea for a capstone mentor, but they're not gonna come speak. Dr. Royer is looking for spots to fill, and that was part of her email to you all, so I'll just reiterate that. If you have a faculty member that you'd really like to hear more about their research, Dr. Royer may be able to set up and have them come speak at the seminar series, okay? Very good. So, uh, capstone mentor talked about who they can be, where they can be from, and now let's talk about what you do once you identify them and get that agreement form uh, taken care of. Now you're gonna move into the preliminary proposal. And we'd like you to get this turned into us by the end of May. Okay, so this is the end of your first year. And this is gonna be good to do because it really sets up that timeline for your second year to get things going. So what you'll do in your proposal, it will have the following components. There'll be a purpose section. And this will ensure that, okay, sorry, the, the purpose of the preliminary proposal is to make sure on, you're on track. We don't want to just let things float and progress and then come into your second year and say, how's your capstone work going? You aren't even started yet? So this is why we have all of these different proposal steps in line. So we really like you to turn in a preliminary proposal by the end of May so you can just see where you're going, what are you thinking of. Preliminary proposal is relatively simple compared with the final. It includes the following components that are on a template. It really couldn't be easier. There's a template you download from the website. It tells you what to put where. It even gives you guidelines as to how many paragraphs we're looking for. Gosh, okay, they're asking for a title, a name, uh, your name, the project site where the work will happen, and then the mentor. That's pretty straightforward. Personal statement. Gosh, personal statement, is this like medical school personal statement? Is this supposed to be five pages or one paragraph? The template lays it all out for you, okay? So you, we do want you to issue a personal statement in your preliminary proposal. Why are you even doing this? Like, just give us a little insight. You can't, you can't do this wrong. You just tell us what's motivating you to look at this area of anatomical science. Background and rationale is where you dig into the literature a bit and you're trying to motivate your work and say, you know, why things haven't been done in this area or what can we extend, the mentor may be a really big help with this because you might be going into an area where you haven't read 50 papers on Alzheimer's disease. The mentor can definitely help you and guide you in your background and rationale. You'll want to put forward objectives and specific aims, discuss the methods, and then provide your references that are coming from your background and rationale portion, okay? And then in terms of evaluation, this preliminary proposal will be sent to your academic advisor and you'll work with your academic advisor to uh, finalize this preliminary proposal. Okay, sounds good, very good. So, you'll get feedback from your academic advisor on your preliminary proposal and this most likely will be my preliminary proposal looks good. Now what do I do? Now that it's the end of May and you've got a preliminary proposal in good shape, now it's time to work on the final proposal, which we're, we're targeting for around the first day of July, okay? So I'll talk about timelines and dates in a, in a little bit more detail later, but for now, the typical flavor, the typical variety is to target your final proposal submitted at the um, beginning of July. Okay, so this will include an evaluation of feasibility and scope. And we also want to have you do this for quality assurance. So now that we have the preliminary proposal that is very brief, it's maybe a page or two, the final is gonna be many, many more pages. And we really want you to do this and flesh out your project and get the details down. So that way we're making sure that your work is appropriate to the graduate level. Nobody wants to be confused when they're looking at your transcript, when they're looking at your resume, and you have a master's in modern human anatomy, and you did something very basic. That would just be awkward and confusing. So we wanna make sure that you're up to the standard of a graduate level project, 
And that's what we're able to do by looking at your proposal a second time, but in greater detail. Okay? This is the final proposal. So guess what? On the website, there is a template, a totally different template for the final than the preliminary. Components of the template are of the final are very similar to the preliminary. Dare I say they're exactly the same? Okay, this is what's different. You do want to include a detailed timeline and projected credit hours per semester. Capstone is a credit hour based course and I'm gonna talk to you about what that looks like. For now we can say that Capstone is an eight credit hour experience. And so what we want you to then do with the final proposal is parse out where are these credit hours gonna happen? Okay, are you gonna do some in the fall, some in the spring, things like that. We'll talk about that in detail. But that's gonna be part of your final proposal. And there could be a budget section. So maybe some of your work requires the acquisition of a different type of equipment to measure gaze, for example. So you can propose that um, as part of your budget, some funds be used out of the MSMHA um, budget to be used to purchase some of this equipment that may be used for your capstone. There are funds available to support this type of thing. Maybe you need some dye for injection. So make sure that you consider that and include it here. Maybe your capstone mentor is gonna take care of everything for you, but maybe your project is a, a little bit more independent and you would like a little bit of financial assistance from the program, okay? So there's a whole financial um, request form and a whole process that you can read about on our website, okay? I don't wanna get into those details now. And of course, references, because you're also gonna have your expanded background and rationale. Cool. So then you will receive feedback from your academic advisor and this will be a decision and notification of the status of your final proposal with a goal of mid-July uh, for that feedback. And there will be um, a review form that is used to give you the feedback for your decision of your um, final proposal. So now that this happens and you have your decision, you can now begin to enroll in the capstone course credit. So I'm not sure, Jennifer, if these dates, I'm not sure if I found an updated date. Is that gonna be? Right, it's the first Monday in August. The first Monday in August, okay, very good. I think that I'm pulling from the 2013 date. Uh, I don't know if I saw this date on the website to update it. So you will then, once you have a decision and um, you know, notification of approval of your final proposal, now you can move forward and you can enroll in capstone course. So for example, you may then start working on your capstone project on August 25th because that's when the semester starts. And this is of your second year, obviously, okay? So that's an example timeline. Maybe you get your project idea and your mentor identified at the end of the spring already and you're ready to get started and work on your capstone project in the summer. This is not a hard timeline. You have to do it this way you may choose to enroll in capstone in summer after your first, like your first summer, I guess you'd say, the summer of 2015 for you guys. So you may choose to enroll in capstone courses um, for the summer. So you could start working on your capstone project in the summer, okay? This is just a possible variety on the timing. Yes. Yeah, it can. Yeah. I would start looking at it immediately. So if you have a good sense, the question, uh, because the mic might not pick it up, was about, um, this mic picked it up, the microphone. So the question was about, what if you have human <laughs> subjects that need to be consented? So that can take a lot of time. You want to build that into your timeline and be conservative with that. Yeah, yeah good point. Uh, that seems a little bit in the wrong order. I would start working on getting your capstone, like the order is get your capstone mentor on board, 
get that preliminary proposal. Can you turn that, these documents in early? I've got an FAQ at the end. The answer to that is yes. Awesome. That's fine. So if you're thinking about doing human subjects that require Comerb approval, that's when you really need to get on your game and get started early. Yep. Uh, Let's have this one. Yeah. How, like, how strict are the guidelines for us actually being working on campus? Like, let's say if we want to do a project, like, out right. internationally or something, when, you know what I mean? Like, how often yeah. are we required to I don't think that there's any requirements for your capstone work to be done in one particular location. Like, if your work needs to be done somewhere else, that's feasible. We're more interested in doing the right amount of work per credit hour. Where that happens, I think there was a proposal for some international work. I don't know if that one actually developed into a, a full-on proposal, but there was a student that was thinking about going uh, somewhere internationally for capstone work, and I think that that is allowable. I, mean, I don't see any limitations on that. So, yep. And also, you know, okay, I'm doing my work on Capstone. Can I analyze data on my laptop at a coffee shop off campus? Yeah, that, that's also acceptable. Yeah. Make sure you're just logging and performing the number of hours to get the work done. But yeah, I think I know what you're saying there. Okay. So the uh, final proposal review could have the following consequences. So this is now the preliminary got the go ahead from the advisor, and now you're developing and fleshing out the detailed final. So approved, that's what you all want. We want that final to be approved. There could be approved with revision. Okay, welcome to science. You know, this happens <laughs> to all of us that are producing any kind of document. There could be some revision that needs to be made. And so what you'll be doing then is submitting the revised proposal, of course, and you'll want to do a cover letter to the mentoring chair committee within two weeks. So this is basically just a cover letter explaining the revisions that were made and what you've done to address the comments of your uh, reviewers, okay, which would be your academic advisor. Okay. And sometimes the revisions can be a little bit substantial, and what may happen is a meeting will be called um, by the mentoring committee, and that would include the advisor meeting, the mentor, and the student. Okay, we just need to get everyone together in the same place kind of understand uh, why the proposal is the shape that it's in, clarify some details, the roles of different people. This can happen, and that will happen by a meeting being called by the mentoring committee as we're kind of tracking the progress of everybody in this process. And there could be the situation of not approved. You haven't put the work in. Uh, there's various reasons why this might happen, but it is a real option, and so the consequence would again be calling a meeting uh, with the mentoring committee, uh, with the advisor, the mentor, and the student, get all the players in the same place, and then we would need to really address the status of the final proposal, and enough time may have passed such that uh, you may not be able to start working on your capstone proposal in the time that you've intended to. So it's really beneficial to you and your graduation on time that you put the work in for the preliminary and the final, and really strive toward working toward this approved uh, final proposal. Okay. All right, so that's kind of uh, what's going on in that summer and leading up from year one into year two. So here's now a uh, potential year two timeline. This isn't hard and rigid, it's just what we recommend to get you graduated in two years. So now the fall picks up again, and what you're going to begin doing is you're going to make progress adherent to the timeline you put forth in your final proposal. Your final proposal the timeline should have, this is what I'm doing in the fall, this is what I'm doing in the spring. I would break it down on the month level, okay? Being specific on a timeline is a good thing. It helps make sure that you're on track. You can pick up when you're missing deadlines a lot easier than, eh, by the end of fall, I should be done with this. Really break it down and be detailed in your steps of your timeline. And we expect you in the fall semester to have regular communication with your capstone mentor depends on the nature of your capstone. If you're, in, if you're in their lab frequently, that might be easier. Um, if they're a clinician that travels a lot, it might be a lot through email, setting up meetings that way, uh, Skype even, right? But make sure that you stick to regular communication with your capstone mentor. That can't be emphasized enough, okay? 
And those academic advisors, they're going to want to know on a monthly basis what's going on. So it would be great if my advisees reported to me every month, but I know you're busy. So if it comes to be the end of September and I haven't heard anything from you, I'll give you an email, ask how things are going, because we're here to support you, right? So if something's not going well, we definitely want to hear about it during this monthly communication. An email may be sufficient. I'm not going to require you to come to my office every month, but. I think you get the idea. We're going to have every semester, you might remember from advising, there's a mandatory meeting every semester between you and your advisor. So there will be that progress report form to be completed. And so for year two in the fall, that would be mid-November. That form is going to cover everything. It's going to cover your coursework, and it's going to cover your capstone project. So when we meet in the middle of fall this year, there's probably not going to be much to talk about for the capstone. We'll probably talk about the idea and the direction you're thinking about going into. But in year two, there's going to be a lot of detail on this progress report form. And we need to identify examination committee members. This is a graduate school requirement that we have a certain number of people that are reviewing your work, that are reviewing uh, your final report and your final presentation. That'll happen in the fall. And we also want to take advantage of elective courses. You need to get your still 43 credit hours, right? Don't want to misspeak. You're going to need to get your 43 credit hours. You're going to get a lot of those from Capstone and from the course, the curriculum within the program. But there's room for electives. So if I were you in the fall, I would take advantage of elective courses as well as independent study that would enhance your Capstone project. Maybe you want to make a module or code in some programming language or use some type of uh, uh, resource, I guess I'm trying to say, and maybe you don't know how to use it appropriately, maybe there's an elective that will teach you how to use it. And so you may want to do that in the fall. Uh, maybe taking a statistics course in the fall, that doesn't seem like a bad idea to me. Don't take an off-the-wall elective. Try to focus your elective courses on something that's going to enhance your capstone project. That would be what I would recommend, okay? And then we get into spring. This is when things start to get exciting, right? It's the last semester of the two years. Follow that timeline. And now uh, Jennifer's done a great job of keeping us up to speed on the process. One of the early forms that you need to submit is the intent to graduate form. I'm not expecting you to kind of commit this to memory, review this later. It's outlined for you on the website. Then there's an application for admission to candidacy form that needs to be submitted. That's around March. Then we're going to have that mid-March mandatory advisor meeting where we revisit that progress report form. Then there's a request for graduate examination. And this is two weeks before you present your capstone work. Okay. All these little boxes to check, right? All these dates to follow. And then the capstone presentation and final capstone report would happen Last year it was the week of April 20th. So we'll take whatever week that was at that time and adjust it for you all when we get to that point in time. And um, then there will also be the submission of the revised final capstone report. So the final capstone report is a written document. And when it's submitted for review to your examination committee, they may find a lot of suggestions or a few suggestions. And they'll give those comments back to you with the expectation that you will revise your capstone report. So it's really good to, to just turn that around and do it right away. And then there will be a deadline sometime around early May for that revised uh, capstone report to be turned in. And then the big day. I think this is correct. I think for them, I think, it, I think we know it's May 22nd, but who's counting, right? That will be a big event at the end of the spring semester. OK? So that's kind of the year two timeline, what you would typically be doing in the fall and then in the spring, with an emphasis in the spring on all of these little boxes to check mark, all of these forms and steps to make sure that you're following up on, OK? It's just what we do um, here at the university. So I keep mentioning, mentioning capstone presentation. So what is that going to be like? What am I going to have to do at the end of this to, to demonstrate my work? We haven't decided yet. But what we are most certain of is that having oral presentations for 24 students is going to be a beast, okay? So we are toying with the idea of a poster presentation. 
Okay, this is what we do. This is what we see in the larger programs on campus. Physical therapy, the medical students, their capstone projects are presented as posters. Maybe we would do some posters and maybe some students would be selected for oral presentations, okay? We don't really know at this point. We have some time to decide. But I would not be surprised if we did an entire poster presentation session. And you can do poster presentations where each student independently gives their pitch, you know, maybe 12 minutes or something. Take us through your poster. That's where we are right now with the presentation of your capstone, in addition to writing it up as a final report. Okay. And again, we're trying to really get this going and get this done this week of April, so that way we meet the graduate school and post deadline. Capstone grading. Capstone is its own course, if you will. It's got its own call number. And the capstone grading is an in-progress grading policy, IP. And that's just due to the ongoing nature of the capstone. It's going to be a project that can't be awarded a grade until it's done. So basically what happens is you would get an in-progress, an IP, that would appear you know, in real time on your transcript. And then retroactively, the final letter grade will replace all of those IPs in your transcript. Okay? The capstone is graded on a letter grading system as follows here. And that's determined at the completion of the project, the end of year two. Okay. And the grade will be based on the final presentation and the final report. Those are the two biggies there. Right? So I've got responsibilities here of the various players um, in the process. And I think that I'm going to run a little bit short of time. So let's see here. Where am I? Oh, we're, we're not doing too bad. So the responsibilities are broken down into the major players of the capstone project. There's you, the student, there's the capstone mentor, and there's the academic advisor. So the bolded, highlighted responsibility of you is to be proactive. Don't expect somebody, a faculty, to email you and say, hey, I know you, I know your interest, how about we work on this project together? Don't assume that's going to happen. Really drive it yourself. Prompt an open communication, we hit on that. Take ownership of the project. Put in your own little twist. Make your own independent contribution. Be professional throughout. Set appointments. Meet those appointments. Be there to meet with your mentor when you are saying that you will be. And this is a really awesome opportunity. You're putting all this work into your capstone. Look for opportunities to present and publish. There's a lot of local and national and even international anatomical sciences um, organizations and therefore conferences. So our students in the past have presented posters for their projects at those conferences. Capstone Mentor, we're going to expect them to oversee the capstone project, also play their part in communication. We're going to have them abide by the mentor mentee agreement form that I'll show you next. And then we also want them to supervise and train you as necessary. Okay? Uh, then the academic advisor also communicating with you throughout the process, and if needed, you know, you may need some help uh, getting in contact or communicating with your capstone mentor, and that's what the academic advisor can facilitate. And if anything comes up, your academic advisor wants to hear about it first, okay? I, the data, it's not working, the methods are falling through, I don't know what's going to happen. Definitely talk to your academic advisor as soon as you can. Here's that student mentor agreement form. I just did the top part here, but the rest is going to outline the different responsibilities of the different people involved, okay? You, your mentor, and then the advisor is already aware of these things, but the advisor is going to need to sign this form as well. So you've already asked several good questions, but I just want to go through some of the more frequently asked questions, okay? And this is the last session or segment of the presentation here. So it's the beginning of May, and I have no leads for a project or mentor. What should I do? Ta-da! Talk to your academic advisor. We'll help sort something out with you. What should I do if my final proposal comes back with the revision request? Remember, it could be approved or approved with revision. Work with your capstone mentor and your academic advisor to address those revisions that are requested. And it's really nice when, and you'll see this in academia as you progress, that we really like as reviewers to have each one of the comments addressed systematically, okay? Don't just take the feedback, 
work it into your revision, and send it back and say, okay, I'm done. It's really nice to take each one of the comments and suggestions and systematically address them. And this is in that cover letter that you submit with your revised proposal. And you know, get suggestion and feedback from us, but don't go off on your own direction. Really try to follow the mentoring committee's directions on addressing uh, these revisions. And if the final proposal is not approved, get into those comments and see what was going on and start discussing options with the academic advisor. These options may include modification of your timeline. But that rarely happens, right? So you're going to do your due diligence from here on out, and everything is going to go smoothly. And the communication that you're going to uh, be partaking in with your advisor is going to minimize this possibility. Right? Right. Awesome. What should I do if my capstone proposal is not progressing according to the timeline? Talk to your academic advisor as soon as you can, because we'll be able to come up with some strategies for getting you back on track. Maybe you scale your project back, something you never know. There's all kinds of different options there. What if I miss the final proposal deadline? Then your final capstone grade and graduation date may be affected. Okay, so we do have some flexibility. We put out these guidelines for these dates. We'll give you the specifics of those when they become a little bit more relevant uh, to you. But if you miss these deadlines, you're really going to have to postpone and push back when you are getting your final capstone grade and your graduation date. Because we can't just let you continue on with a mini capstone project. You're still going to have to meet the capstone requirements, and that might push you beyond May of your graduation date. And you may have more of a summer graduation, OK? So if you know that you're going to miss deadlines, please talk to the mentoring committee chair as soon as possible. Okay. And if you miss graduate school deadlines, graduation may be delayed. That's why we're lucky to have Jennifer Thurston on board, because she helps us monitor these deadlines, makes them clear, so we all get those boxes checked, OK? No flexibility with the grad school. Just view it that way. A little bit of flexibility internally, but we've got to meet those graduate school imposed deadlines. What should I do if I want to change the project or the mentor? Talk with the academic advisor. We'll have some. Um, options or some alternatives for you that we can talk about. And it is likely to affect graduation date because you really need to enroll in all of the capstone credits per project. And if you're doing a certain number of capstone credits for one project and then you switch projects, you need to do those capstone credits again for that different project. You don't get to do capstone mini. You got to do the full capstone again. And so that would likely result in enrolling in more than eight capstone credits. What if the mentor I want to work with is also my academic advisor? So for example, what if I have a project posted? What if we're talking about our own interests and they align and we want to do something? I cannot be both your mentor and your academic advisor. There's a conflict there. We need to have multiple eyes looking at the project. And so those eyes can't be shared. So you'd have to notify the mentoring committee and then I would assist in assigning a new academic advisor. Okay? We would take care of that conflict through the mentoring committee. Okay, how many capstone credits should I enroll in each semester? I really had you in suspense for a long time there. So here is ultimately that talk. There is a lot of flexibility to work with your capstone mentor and your academic advisor to determine the answer for this question. And we definitely want you, in talking with your capstone mentor, for them to help you identify how many hours of work this step in your capstone is going to have is going to involve around 45 hours of work is equivalent to one credit hour of capstone okay so should you enroll in all your capstone course um, or in some capstone course during summer after your first year definitely we had the question about comerb i need to get started on that maybe you're ready to go with your mentor and your project to get started this upcoming summer. So you can definitely register and take capstone course during your first summer. But Jennifer, help me out with the implications here. Three times, three credits during the summer are, is considered full time, which would then make you eligible for financial aid. OK, good. What if I can't or don't want to enroll in courses during the summer but still want to do capstone related things? Flexibility. There's an option there. We'll talk with your academic advisor and your mentor to make sure that your summer work 
is counted toward, toward credit hours in the fall semester. Okay, so don't feel like I'm putting all this time into working on my capstone during the summer and it's not going to count toward anything. We're going to take that into consideration, okay? A lot of retroactive action going on here. What if I don't want to or even need to graduate in two years? What if I really like this campus and the program and everyone involved? That's fine. You have up to five years to complete the program. <laughs> Communicate with the academic advisor to arrange a new timeline. Can I submit my capstone related documents before the deadline? I alluded to this earlier. Yes, please. Do you guys have class at 11? No. Okay. Is it okay if I just eat into that 10 minute buffer a little bit? That's just FAQs. You could read these on your own if you need to go, but I think I'll be able to just get through them uh, in the next couple minutes. What if I want or need to leave the program after completion of the first year? Maybe uh, you get into uh, medical school, for example, as long as you have not enrolled in capstone, no IP in, in progress grade or subsequent replacement letter grade will show up on your transcript. Okay, so as capstone is concerned, what if you leave the program after the first year? That's no problem. There won't be an, an IP grade as long as you have not enrolled in capstone. You tell me the answer. Can I submit my capstone related documents before the deadline? Yes. Please. Okay, so that's all the FAQs, and we have as much time as you want to be here to address any other questions, starting here. So, what if um, we have a faculty member who is doing research that we're choosing, but then we find another faculty member, let's say, who's using some type of technology that we're interested in, uh, and we're in some type of medium where we need their technology yeah. to put their research. Okay. Who do we kind of toward, like, who do we need it towards for? Okay. So the situation where maybe you have co-mentors, right? And that is possible. It is definitely possible to have co-mentors. Now your question is about which mentor would you consider the primary or who yeah, would you talk to secondary. first? You're going to just have to think about your area and your topic and think about, in your example, maybe the research question is in one area, but you need the help of the technology-related capstone mentor for a method that fits into your capstone. That's what I'm kind of hearing. Mm -hmm. So we can talk about the specifics with your academic advisor, but from what I'm hearing, it's probably you'd have a more of a primary mentor with the research area, the research question. But don't yeah, hesitate to reach out to somebody that might have a certain uh, microscope or imaging device, and they could help out in that way and be a co-mentor. That's good. You're welcome. You're all thinking about Capstone right now at this point in the, in the program, I know. But we tried to put a lot of the frequent ones together here. And that is a great list that's been put together. Um, so, you know, most people ask if there's any questions, and the study showed that you wait three seconds, but you need to wait ten. <laughs> right? People, people consistently underestimate this time frame, so that's what I've been filling this awkward silence with lately. And we're, oh, yeah, oh, wow! At the buzzer. Hi. No, don't apologize. Do not okay. apologize. You want to market it and yeah. capitalize on it, or somebody take it. So all I can all I can say, and I'll turn it over to other folks, is that their intellectual property is of the University of Colorado. So I think that they would help defend this, or you would be covered in their copyright protection. I'm beyond my reach. We have yeah, we have legal. Oh, okay. oh right. Okay. Yeah. Ah, okay. Okay. Cool. I saw your hand first.
in the symposia I've gone to, in the websites I've visited, the clinicians I know. I'm not thinking of any imaging databases. It sounds like a pretty reasonable expectation for there to be some, so we can dig deeper. Oh. I saw other hands. Yeah. Um, so, kind of that, so what that you know, the, the conflict of interest. Yeah, it's so I'm going to actually take two minutes. So, yeah, I'm trying yeah. to figure out, I think you more said that in error, actually, now that that will be for a And I, what I think is that you were sent in, in error. Um, the conflict of interest email. <laughs> The conflict of interest email pertains to students who are working for faculty members who have NIH grant funding. Um, so I, that's pretty. That excludes all you for sure. There might be one or two second year students involved, but it, just ignore that for now. And if I find out differently, I'll be back in touch with you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, back to the conflict. Sorry. <laughs> I totally went off on a different yeah, conflict of interest. depends on who owns the data, I guess. So tech transfer, if that's the nature of what you come up with, that's tech transfer. But yeah, I mean, I think it would be isolated to that lab that you've done the work in. I'm thinking about my own master's degree and, and uh, PhD, and if I wanted to build on that, you can definitely transfer your intellectual thoughts. Like, I would like to now expand what I did at CU, but in a different location. But the data were acquired using equipment at CU Anschutz. Can I copy that to a hard drive and take it with me? My thought is no. So it definitely depends on the nature. Your question is kind of broad, but I think that we'll tackle it as we get more down to the specifics. But <laughs> if it does, yeah. What with your mentor? What with your mentor yeah. on? Yeah, there is, and I may not know all the details that you could probably hit on, but so there yeah. is funding available for capstone projects. For capstone. Um, there is a certain limit on how much you can request for, which will become a little more apparent as we move forward. Okay. But um, there is limited funding available. Okay, because I, I know data often will cost money, and this is a brief like in two years. Exactly. Like if you're submitting it to a um, a conference, maybe no, an abstract or for, just internal um, review by your advisor. Okay, gotcha. Because you know I've received documents without the mentor having gone through it, and I can tell that no, 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 this this can't come to me. It, this is not this has not been reviewed by the advisor, uh, the mentor, because I know the mentor, and 
he or she wouldn't let this go through, you know? <laughs> so don't let that happen, because you know, if, if I didn't know that mentor, I would have thought, oh my god, what a terrible mentor. <laughs> so, make sure you have the mentor's input before anything goes out. Um, oh, and, and especially when you're talking, uh, trying to find the mentor outside of kind of our own unit in a clinical area or something like that. Remember back to your prof the professional talk during your orientation about representing yourself in a professional manner because you're now representing not only our program, but your peers and the future students of our program. We want uh, you know, the situation to be so that the clinicians will eventually come to us asking for students, because you were such joy to work with. You know? So kind of remember that, the, and the uh, ambassadors of our Cool, thank you, Dr. Lee. The link to the slides is here on the board. Remember, it's case sensitive. This has been recorded. Just give me some time to figure out how to make it available to you.